Good afternoon. My name is Christina, and we are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We've developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone is able to see the title slide on their computer. We've muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all attendees. We will go through all questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done using the menu panel. In the menu on your screen, go to view and then select full screen. We estimate the main bulk of the presentation will take about one hour and we will allow some time for questions at the end. We encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat icon at top or side of your screen and then typing your question to the host. We'd like to hear from you. You can contact us via phone or email or you can contact the presenter directly. Send your email to bruce at brucearts.com. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Bruce Archambault is an IBM Distinguished Engineer Emeritus at IBM RTP and Adjunct Professor at Missouri University, Rolla, Missouri. He received his BSEE degree from the University of New Hampshire in 1977 and his MSEE degree from Northeastern University in 1981. He received his PhD from the University of New Hampshire in 1997. His doctoral research was in the area of computational electromagnetics applied to real-world EMC problems. He held positions at Digital Equipment Corporation and Seth Corporation supporting product design and EM analysis. In 1997, he joined IBM in Riley, North Carolina, where he's the lead EMC engineer responsible for EMC tool development and use on a variety of products. Bruce has authored or co-authored a number of papers in computational electromagnetics, mostly applied to real-world EMC applications. He is currently a member of the Board of Directors for the IEEE EMC Society. He is the author of the book, PCB Design for Real-World EMI Control, and the lead author of the book titled EMI EMC Computational Modeling Handbook. He has lectured at the University of Oxford for the last 13 years. So without further ado, let me hand the presentation over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Christina. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. Um, let me uh, get started here with uh, sharing my screen. A minute while my computer catches up to my clicks. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. I'll go into, let's see. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, electromagnetic band gap structures for common mode filtering of high speed differential signals. Quite a mouthful here. But really, the bottom line is that it's very difficult to filter um, common mode signals for very high speed differential signals. In fact, uh, it's, it's all, it is impossible to purchase uh, discrete common mode filters for your circuit boards 
Uh, that operate above about um, 6 gigahertz without destroying the intentional signal as well. So basically, common mode noise, as uh, I spoke about the last uh, webinar, is pretty much inevitable in any kind of differential signal. There's going to be some in-pair skew, which is a uh, delay of one signal relative to the other. Uh, sometimes this is caused by uh, slightly different length of your traces. Sometimes it's caused by uh, other things that cause uh, imbalance in your signaling. If the, tr if the pair of traces get too close to the edge of a ground plane or if, the, uh, if they go through vias and have a ground via that's, that's nearby and so forth, all these things can cause uh, this kind of mismatch. A rise fall time mismatch is probably one of the most difficult to control because there's nothing you can do about this on your circuit board other than filter it and it, because it comes right out of the silicon itself and so other than buying uh, expensive um, ICs it's really difficult to uh, to uh, control this and basically any asymmetry in the channel is going to cause some amount of common mode noise so it's a big problem in EMC. In fact, at IBM, I'd say that uh, maybe something like 90% of the time that we're fighting EMC problems in the lab, it's because of uh, common mode noise. And usually, actually, it's, it's rise fall time mismatch. And that, that's usually a second harmonic of the, um, of the data rate. So if you have a 10 gigabit signal, for example, the fundamental frequency is 5 gigahertz. The second harmonic would be then 10 gigahertz. And so somehow or other, we have to um, uh, decrease this EMC problem. And, and oh, by the way, it's not just an EMC problem. It can also increase differential crosstalk. You know, when we do the normal signal integrity analysis, we're looking at just regular differential, differential crosstalk. But if we're going through a connector, for example, from one board to another, and we have some amount of mode conversion where we're going from differential mode to common mode, uh, creating more common mode noise, and this happens a lot in connectors because there's this skew oftentimes in connectors. Well, this common mode to differential mode, I mean the differential mode to common mode conversion is the same as common mode to differential mode. And so any crosstalk that's happening that's common mode to common mode, and then we go through some connector that has this mode conversion, we end up with more crosstalk than what we expected. We need to have a common mode filter without reducing the differential mode, of course, because as it is, it's very difficult to get the differential mode filters to work, uh, differential mode uh, signals rather, to work properly. The amount of loss in the, in the printed circuit boards, in the, uh, in the connectors, in the cables, or whatever might be there, uh, means that oftentimes we're barely able to make the differential eye opening that we need. So whatever filter we come up with, we need to have something that won't hurt the differential signal. And basically, just as I mentioned earlier, discrete filter components um, usually will reduce the differential mode signal and cost a lot of money. And even with that, they're limited in frequency. Right now, as far as I can recall, the, the highest frequency common mode filter that you can purchase as a discrete component is for USB version 3, um, which is a 6 gigabit signal which means that the fundamentals are 3 gigahertz, maybe the third harmonic at 9 gigahertz. That's the best that you can get through this common mode filter differentially and not, and not um, hurt the, the differential signal. But now we're, we're shipping products with 8 gigabits, 10 gigabits, 12 gigabits, uh, working on uh, 16 and 25 gigabits. So these uh, filters that you can buy are just not going to cut it. And so the EBGs have been shown to reduce this common mode noise without having to have a discrete component. Basically, the way it works is that we make some etching in the nearest ground reference plane. Now, normally, we always say don't make cuts in your ground plane, um, certainly for single-ended signals. So we don't want to do that because that's going to uh, hurt the, uh, the return current path. But these residents, but these shapes that we're going to cut in the ground plane under a differential pair will create a resonance at that desired frequency, and we can um, block the common mode noise with these by these resonances. 
One of the important things, I think, as you look at different EBG filters, and there's many different types of them out there. I'm just going to be talking about one general style today. But the most important thing is that we can design in advance the sizes that you need in order to get to the common mode filtering performance that you need. Most of the time, what I find is that somebody will show a common mode filter, and, and they'll have uh, done some simulations, they'll build one and validate their simulations and all that's all, all fine and good. But when you ask them, how did you come up with the size? Is How did you design this so that it was going to filter out 8 gigahertz, for example, or, or 10 gigahertz, whatever frequency we decide we need? And they would say, oh, well, we just kind of try it and see and keep on trying different simulations or different measurements until we finally get it the right size. Well, that's not design, in my opinion. That's just experimentation until you finally luck into something. Um, the easy but you filters I'll be talking about today, we can design these in advance with some very simple formulas uh, to come up with the common mode filter that we want. So today I'm going to start out with the simplest EBG filter design and show some measurement validation, and then we'll go into some kind of specialist specialized uh, designs, uh, the zigzag design to reduce the amount of space needed, miniaturization again to reduce the amount of board space needed, and then uh, talk about both strip line and microstrip as well as how can we widen the bandwidth of the notch filter here. So the basic design looks like this, where I'm taking a um, uh, uh, pair of differential traces like you see. They happen to be in an L shape. They don't have to be. And you can see that I've got some square patches here that, uh, that we're crossing basically some splits. These patches are floating. They are not connected by vias to ground or anything like that. And if you look at the, um, the cutaway view below, you can see that what we see here is the um, uh, the stack up. I uh, get the two traces on top, and then I've got a um, uh, the, the cut planes, and then below that I've got a solid ground plane. The performance is going to depend on the uh, the number of gap crossings, and the frequency of the notch that we're going to get depends on the 2D cavity formula created by that that patch and the ground plane below it. And what's nice about this is that we can calculate this with using power integrity tools, or just actually two simple, uh, rather simple 2D uh, cavity resonance formulas, and that's going to correspond to the uh, where the notches are. And so we look here, we see the uh, the blue line is basically the power integrity that if I was to uh, do this 2D cross-section analysis, I can see that where the peaks are going to be, and you can see they line up with the notches above. And, and the ones that we really care about, if we look at the, uh, the legend there, if you're not familiar with some of this terminology, the red line, for example, is SDD21. SDD21 means I'm putting in a differential signal and looking at the differential output. Uh, putting in signal at port 1, looking at port 2. And you can see that for this particular example here, the amount of loss that we're getting in the red line is very, very minimal, which is what we want. Then if we look at the um, SCC21, which is the black dots, that's again now we're putting in a common mode signal, looking at how much common mode signal comes out the end of port 2 for what we put into port 1. And you can see that, that the notches correspond with the uh, the power integrity blue lines very nicely. And and that's what we're trying to accomplish here is to get some notch filtering here. It happens to also line up with just a regular S21 for a single ended signal. And so some of the data I'll show you it was just simpler to analyze one trace rather than two traces since common mode on differential uh, pairs is the same as a single ended signal um, with, with just one trace. So the two-dimensional cavity resonance formula is given here, where uh, M and N are the modes, and A and B are the sizes. And so we can simplify this down as the, the formulas show. I'm not going to focus on these formulas here. You can look at these at your leisure and go through them. But this is the first step to calculating where the resonant frequency is going to be by setting the, uh, the size of the patch that we need. We did some validation. You can see the pictures here of the, um, the printed circuit board that we built. And um, some of the structures that we built there are shown in the middle. We had uh, EBG with three sections or two sections. 
Uh, we had multiple differential pairs crossing or just a single differential pair crossing, uh, all different kinds of uh, options here. And basically what we found was was pretty good uh, simulation and measurement comparison. So this is without any EVG. And uh, if we look at the um, differential signal, uh, that would be the red dot, the red dashed line, I should say, and the purple dots, and they don't line up on top of each other. They have the same general shape, but the reason that they're off by a little bit is that the loss tangent of the dielectric material of the Britain circuit board was not well characterized by the vendor. But the overall shape is, is showing, and you'll see in the next plot, the resident frequencies of the EBG, which is what's really important, is, is lining up well. And we can also see the common mode um, loss here. Again, the general shapes are are going well, and it's just the loss tangent at these very high frequencies was not well characterized by the, the manufacturer of the print circuit board. All right, so now if we look at the EBG filter, then what we really care about is where those notches are, and you can see that uh, both the simulation and the uh, measurement uh, have the notches lining up very nicely at um, uh, five, six gigahertz or so, which is what the target frequency for this filter was. Um, and then up at really high frequencies, above 10 gigahertz, uh, that isn't where this filter was targeted, and we wouldn't be using this kind of dielectric materials for those kind of frequencies if we were. So it's not so important. And if I zoom in, you can see again that we, we did a pretty good job of capturing the, uh, the common mode filter for simulation and measurements. The, uh, the notches are looking pretty good there. All right, so now um, for the circuit board real estate, real estate, of course, is always at a premium, so we need to reduce the footprint of the EBG. So one of the things we tried to do was use a zigzag configuration. And what I mean by that is instead of just going straight across like the upper picture on the right is showing, we are going uh, over and then back again like the lower picture on the right is kind of showing, so it kind of zigzag back on itself. And if we just do two independent crossings, we get the, uh, the red dashed line for a filter here. Uh, you see that the depth of the notch is about 15 dB. If we do four independent crossings, the depth of the notch is more than 30 dB. But if we do four multiple crossings, where we're zigging back and forth, like that picture is showing on the lower right, uh, we're still getting 25 dB. So this is a pretty good filter here for uh, a pretty good performance and not having to have as many of those patches by reusing the same patch with the zigzag. So we, we did this with even more. So here's a, a little better picture to compare six um, straight across independent crossings versus a zigzag back and forth. And the pictures are not to scale. You use the same size patches in both cases. So you can see that we would you know, reduce the size of the, um, the filter significantly with this kind of zigzag. And overall, the, the filtering looks pretty good here. The, um, the green is the zigzag with six crossings and the blue is the independent six crossings. And while the depth of the notch is not the same, um, really don't care too much about the depth of the notch uh, as the main thing to, to use as a, as a filter performance, because it's not likely the harmonic we're trying to filter is gonna be exactly, exactly on that particular uh, depth, deep notch. Really what we're looking for in most cases is somewhere around 10 or 12 dB of filtering, and you can see that by the oval there, I'm showing that it's about the same whether we did independent crossings or zig, um, zigzag crossings, and uh, we're still getting a pretty good band, uh, notch band there. So even if our harmonic is off by a little bit, um, we we're going to be able to filter it anyway. Okay, and then we wanted to look at um, crosstalk as well. If we were to do two uh, differential pairs on the zigzag configuration, and this shows the overall uh, uh, configuration in the stack up here and the distances and so forth. And the um, near end crosstalk is still looking pretty good. Um, it's a little bit higher with EBG than without the EBG, but still uh, over most of the frequency range, it's less than uh, the crosstalk's less than 20 dB, which is usually the target that most signal integrity engineers are pretty happy with. In fact, in many cases, they'll just they'll be okay with up to 10 dB. So uh, so this is still looking pretty good. And if you look at the fire and crosstalk, it looks pretty much the same, whether it's EBG or not. And so um, overall, we're not 
making the crosstalk any worse by doing two of these things on the zigzag like that. Now, I mentioned earlier we want to miniaturize this to reduce the total amount of area. Instead of having um, multiple patches here, what we decided to do is put these little bridges or little traces between the patches to increase the inductance between the patches and try to still use the, uh, the EBG structure but make it smaller because the inductance of these narrow sections is going to be higher and that will allow our resonant frequency to go up. And so this just kind of shows that um, the A dimension, which is A1 there, which is left to right, we reduce that down to A2. You can see that in the second picture. And then we reduced B, which is the, the vertical section, down to B2 and made it a much smaller thing. And so uh, ultimately this, this reduced the uh, size of the patches uh, dramatically and the size of the EBG filter quite a bit. And what we find here is that um, if 10 dB is our target, we kind of put a little line across there. You can see that having the traditional one there, a single uh, set of patches, we're getting uh, filtering from about uh, 4.7 to about 5.1 gigahertz. When we reduce all the way down to the small one, the green case, we actually have widened out the um, the bandwidth here, so still meeting the 10 dB target, but over even a wider frequency range than the single one was, which is which is good. Um, okay, and then looking at the reduction here, the main thing that we're going to look at here is the total surface required, and we went from um, 650 square millimeters down to 121, so we're using less than 20 percent of the of the original real estate with the uh, the miniaturized patch. Um, so that's pretty dramatic and pretty effective. Um, so we consider this to be pretty pretty good. So now we've got to try to create these miniaturized ones, and we don't want to have a, a try it and see kind of approach. We want to try to figure out some way to design it up front, like I was talking about. And and it's not quite as straightforward as the original design, where we just could use a 2D cavity resonance. We have to have a two-stage design process. The first stage is going to get us close and we'll analyze it to see how close we are and then we'll make an adjustment and uh, and be able to design and we'll see how well that works out. All right, so here's some, some formulas here of how to calculate the inductance and how to calculate the frequencies that we want here for the, um, uh, for the filter, for the miniaturized filter. Again, I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, I've got a bunch of references at the end of this presentation that explain the formulas and, and show more detailed examples of how to get there that I can do in a short presentation like this. Um, ultimately, we come down to um, what the inductance of the bridge is going to be. And again, just some formulas here. The exact uh, numbers are not important as, as it is the, the concept. And then so ultimately, we came up with a design of our initial design here uh, with these dimensions, given the epsilon that we had and, and so forth. And so we ended up with a patch that was 2.8 millimeters on a side. And when we did a full wave analysis, we decided we found that the notch was just slightly below 4.5 gigahertz and we wanted 5 gigahertz for this particular filter. And uh, so this was a, a 10 gigabit, um, no, I'm sorry, a 5 gigabit. Um, design, so the, dif the intentional differential signal was 5 gigabit, um, so we wanted to notch out the second harmonic, and so that was going to be a notch at 5 gigahertz. So we were off a little bit, but we expected that because uh, this is not as, as uh, precise as the initial design, so we need, re need to refine this. Now, we could do multiple full wave analysis, but that's undesirable. This, these analyses take a long time and require expensive tools and somewhat of an expert to, to run them. So we, we came up with an alternative, uh, the circuit analysis, and basically what we decided was that we could do a, um, you see the, the ports there across the top uh, of the lower picture, P1 and P2 and P and so forth. So we can do a simple cavity resonance on that to come up with what the um, Z parameters would be. And then we looked at the side view in the upper picture there where we have an inductance section and then we have this port, this kind of the ground plane is, is um, disturbed by the cut of the patch. And so we put these ports in there 
it makes a little more sense maybe if I go to the uh, spice equivalent circuit. So we had a transmission line segment where the the uh, the reference of the transmission line was this impedance of the uh, of the port of what we just what we analyzed there, and so we basically put a um, Normally in SPICE, you end up with a perfect ground. We put an imperfect ground in there, okay? And that's how we did this and found that, uh, indeed, if we do this, the full wave and this um, circuit analysis based on the cavity model uh, agree pretty well. And so we thought that we were getting pretty good results in the 5 gigahertz region with this simplified approach. And now what we can do is we can say, okay, if I look at the, uh, the EBG filter, versus what I'm getting for the, um, the, the simplified model. Um, again, my target was 5 gigahertz. You see that uh, the equivalent circuit model is giving me a notch a little bit higher in frequency than the full wave model did, but still overall pretty close So for the simplified thing we're doing here. So that basically now we can look at what the actual um, resonant frequency or, or notch frequency is versus what we want, come up with a, a delta here, and then and then adjust the um, the resonant frequency to be what we really want it to be with this formula. And when we did that, the um, the 5 gigahertz it came out much better. So the equivalent circuit model is showing pretty good here. And the notch is not as quite as wide with a full wave model as the equivalent circuit model, but still we're capturing a good uh, 10 dB at 5 gigahertz either way, and so we felt this was, was pretty good. All right, now, I've been showing microstrip results where this, the trace is on the outside on the top of the bottom of the, of the board. So now what we want to do is, well, what happens when we're on the inside of the board? Um, a strip line configuration. Do we have to have the EBG layer in, above and below um, as the bottom picture shows, or can we get away with just it on one side? And really the bottom line is that you have to have it on both, um, because if you if you use the, uh, the middle case, there, the blue outline, you can see that the notch is minimal, and uh, that's and that's because basically what's happening is the return current has an option um, on that trace here. That red line is the trace. Return current can either you know use the EBG filter, which is a resonance and blocking it, or the return current can use the uh, the solid plane above, and that's what it does. So if in the lower case with a green outline around the picture, we see that uh, EBG is on both upper and lower, uh, and then solid planes on upper and lower from the EBG layers, and we get a good uh, a good deep notch uh, from that. So when we're doing strip line, we really have to uh, uh, do it both, which uses a lot more layers than the uh, microstrip case, no doubt about it. Okay, now the, the next thing was we wanted to widen that filter notch out a little bit because uh, for various um, experiments that we did where we actually built boards, we found that the, uh, the actual knowledge of what the uh, dielectric constant was, uh, especially at high frequencies, was very limited. And so, you know, we're not exactly sure exactly where the resonance is going to be. We can design it to what we want with a dielectric constant that we think we're going to get, but that if the manufacturer's um, process has a dielectric constant slightly different than we thought, we could miss. And so we wanted to widen the notch so that no matter um, where the exact uh, notch is, we'll be sure to cover the frequency we're interested in. So basically these three uh, vertical uh, filters are designed, as you can see at the bottom, they're slightly different in size. And so we're going to have basically have three different filters that are designed over three different frequencies. In this case here, 5.15, 5.4, 5 and 5.67 um, to get a, a final bandwidth that's centered at 5 gigahertz um, with a 700 megahertz bandwidth, and uh, that shows here. So overall, this is um, widening out the bandwidth and, and does a pretty good job to uh, to do that without. Uh, and this, we're still using a miniaturized um, EBG structure, so this is still doing a pretty good, uh, pretty good footprint as well. Pretty small footprint. And so this is just um, showing another example here where we had um, a different different sizes and. Uh, 
and, and how that related to the uh, oops sorry how that related to the, uh, the filter performance. Okay. All right, so basically the um, the main point of all this is we're going to we're going to have common mode noise on differential signals. Uh, we're going to try to minimize that, hopefully, um, but ultimately you're not going to be able to get rid of it all. And especially um, difficult to, to eliminate is the second harmonic that comes straight out of the silicon. Basically, as I said earlier, nothing that I do is going to change how much uh, filtering I get. I mean, so nothing I do is going to change how much common mode noise I, I get that's coming straight out of the silicon, no matter what I do in the print circuit board. So these EBG filters can be designed to filter this common mode noise without hurting the differential signal and without having to put an expensive discrete component directly on the circuit board. And again, at most of these frequencies, we can't even purchase the components. They just don't exist at this point. We were able to reduce the uh, overall footprint by using the zigzag approach as well as miniaturization. And we really cut down the amount of space needed with the miniaturization to, to less than 20% of the initial uh, designs. So that's pretty significant. We can get a wider notch, which is normally recommended uh, by using slightly different filter sections designed so that, again, we don't have to worry about whether the um, uh, filter is, is um, whether the filter is is going to be too dependent on the dielectric constant from the uh, from the vendor, and finally, if we are using strip line, then the EBG has to be both above and below the actual um, traces. As I mentioned, I've got a number of different uh, references that are associated with these um, with these um, slides. Um, I didn't. I want to put quite so many on there, but there's been quite a bit of work on this, and they go through a lot of the details of um, how to actually build the EBG filters and a lot more details on the validation and so forth. So, okay, with that, um, that ends my presentation. I'll be happy to accept any questions. Hi, Bruce. So, it looks like we've got a couple of questions here. Um, first one is, in slides 36 through 39, your discussion about refining design to too much, does this involve hardware respins? No, this is all done with um, simulation. So the, the idea here is that you would, you said 36 to 39? That's what this says, yes, 36 to 39. Well, if we're talking about uh, refining the, um, the EBG design with these slides here that I'm showing now, um, that was all done with simulations using SPICE or full wave. You could use full wave too. But before we ever actually build hardware, we're going to actually uh, go through this process, adjust the target frequency based on how much error we get um, with the, the first pass, and then We'll know this once we've adjusted the target frequency. We can come up with the, the the second size patches that we need, and that's what we'll actually implement in hardware. So we don't have to do a hardware respin. That was the whole point of this. Well, there you go. Okay. Um, the next question: What would be the effect of adding more patches to the EBG filter? Well, basically, if you add more patches, you get a deeper notch and a little wider bandwidth. Um, it does take more real estate on the circuit board, so that's one of the reasons why when we did the um, uh, wider bandwidth, we only used three sections rather than go for um, adding more horizontally and getting more, um, take a much more board real estate. But basically the answer to the question is, the more patches, the deeper the, the notch. Okay. All right, let's see, okay. Why is the focus on second harmonic of the data rate? Well, as I mentioned a little bit ago, um, the second harmonic is very difficult to uh, to control because it comes out of the um, uh, directly out of the silicon. And I don't have a picture of this, but if you were to look at a pseudo random bit stream uh, that has rise fall time mismatch, the data itself will be a 
kind of a, has an envelope of kind of sine x over x. So it's it's very broadband data. You know, that depending on the exact moment we look at this, the uh, the actual harmonics of the data itself will be moving back and forth. However, the, the even harmonics that are that exist the nulls of the data uh, because the data is going to be associated with the, the, the odd harmonics, the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and so forth. But the even harmonics um, are are just like a clock signal, very narrow band, very tall, and uh, and very difficult to uh, uh, to deal with. So that, in my experience, at, and, and here at IBM and other companies have had the same experience, when we're using these high-speed data lines, the even harmonics are usually the, the biggest problem that we have to fight. Okay. Um, let's see. Another question: Is there a method to have a tunable design? Uh, uh, so a tunable design where you don't have to change the uh, the printed circuit board. Um, yes, there is actually. Um, it's not covered in this presentation, but it, we call it the removable EBG. And basically, what this does is uh, is you put an EBG on a little daughter card, and then you come along your traces, say microstrip, and you have a uh, uh, some some uh, connector of some sort, um, maybe just pads on a, a small daughter card that you solder on. And then, uh, so now I have a filter that I can have today, filters five gigahertz, and tomorrow if I go to a higher data rate with my electronics, I can take off that five gigahertz removable daughter card and put an eight gigahertz on there, or 10 gigahertz, or whatever I have to do. So there is a technique for that. Um, and it's called removable EBG structures. Um, and if you go to uh, IEEE Explorer, um, you can certainly find some information on that. Or if people want, they can email me and I can point them to some references. All right, great. Um, I think that is the end of our questions. So, um, before we go, uh, on Wednesday, June 24th, we have our Group Six Pack Series, Episode Six, and that's going to be covering effective materials for high-frequency EMC design. Um, episodes one through five are available as recordings to our Academy website. Um, Bruce, uh, were there any events outside of our Washington Labs Academy training that maybe you wanted to mention? Sure. Um, I am actually teaching a um, three-day printed circuit board design seminar that I'll include. Uh, some information on EBGs as well as common mode filters, but many, many other things. And that's actually happening next week in uh, Devons, Massachusetts. Uh, this is being done in conjunction with In Compliance Magazine. Um, and you can go to my website, brucearch.com, and look under seminars to, uh, to get pointers to that um, seminar. As well as I, I'll be teaching again at Oxford University um, at the very end of June, June 30th, through uh, July 2nd or 3rd, um, and you can go to, uh, again, my website to get pointers to that if you want to go over to Oxford University, if you can get your boss to send you there. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I've had people come from the U.S. all the way to Oxford because they kind of wanted a vacation anyway, and they managed to talk their boss into it. So. Uh, Very nice. Okay. So thank That's, you. Yeah, great. I'm sure people will be interested in uh, checking that out. So brucearch.com, everybody. Um, let's see. I, I guess <clears throat> just do a quick word about our other Washington Labs training. Um, this on-screen URL connects you to the Academy page where you'll find information on all of our webinars and resident courses available on a variety of engineering, designing, and testing topics, right, some listed here. We have wireless device approval. It's a webinar series. The uh, July 15th webinar will be going over SAR and radiation hazards from transmitters. Our MIL-461 testing is also a series of webinars covering everything you need to know about testing the MIL standard 461. Session six of 12 will be happening on June 17th, and that's covering CS114 testing. Uh, product safety. June the 18th is the next session, and that's going to be covering electrical shock protection. 
The IEC EN FCC testing webinar series is well underway. We have session three happening on June 25th, and that's going to discuss CW immunity, so it's radiated, conducted, and magnetic immunity. Um, as with today's webinars, previous webinars from each of these series are available as recordings through the Academy website. We also provide customized training at your place or ours, and webinars are available in multi-part series, so you can mix and match them. You can take one session or a few from any combination of available webinars from any multi-part series, or sign up for a complete offering of the Academy training courses happening throughout the calendar year. Please be sure to visit Academy Training webpage to check out the latest training course topics and dates. We also like to hear from you with suggestions on future topics that we can pre present. So uh, before we go, let me take a look and see if we have any other questions. Anyone? Okay. I haven't seen any other ones come in, so I'm going to go ahead and conclude the webinar on behalf of myself. Bruce Archambault and the Washington Labs Academy, I would like to thank you all for attending. At this point, I will go ahead and end the event, and I wish everyone a good day. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Okay, thanks very much. All righty. Bye-bye, Bruce. Bye now.